It's been a ride. It's been a real trip. As we come to the end of Kaguya Season 3. I really hope there's more of this show. I don't know how it's going to end this this episode, but it's just such a great show. Such a great character. Such a great premise. Senpai. Dual Confessions Part 2. Uh, yeah, this is the, the problem with dating someone super popular. She's just in high demand, being the goddess that she is. Especially for someone like Ishigami, who's already doubting his, his worth in this whole dynamic. And we found the missing heart. Indeed, it is. I feel like we're gonna do a lot of losing this episode. I hope, at least. <laughs> Yeah, the show does such a great job expressing this dilemma super well. It's very interesting to me, and I think there's two aspects of it. The part that I think just is what it is, and it's just sort of a facet of life, is the whole Evangelion hedgehog dilemmas thing, where to open up your heart to someone, to give them your life, almost inevitably means risk of some kind. Part of being in a deep relationship with someone means tying your identity to them in some way. And maybe that's not 100% a prerequisite, but I think that's sort of just the natural course it takes. You know, if you spend this much time with someone and you make your relationship or your future with them a point of focus, it just becomes part of who you are and your identity. So you're literally putting yourself at stake in a sense. And if they were to betray you or lose interest in you, it literally can feel like a death. And it is in a sense because parts of you will die. And actually, I don't think everyone even has to enter that realm. You know, I, I know people, and I was just talking to a friend about this, who kind of live in a more stable zone where they kind of are who they are no matter what. They've found a way to make their whole life independent and self-directed. And that might be healthy in its way. And I think that it's certainly more stable and more comfortable. But I think the trade-off of that is you miss sort of the highs. You know, there's, there's sort of nothing like having this really deep affection for someone and having someone be your whole world. I feel like that, that arena has the potential for some real beauty, the flip side of which being intense pain. But that sort of is what it is. But then I think there's the other aspect of it. And that's the part of them that is wearing a mask in what they think is protecting themselves or to create sort of a split between what we are, what we really are, and what we want to show the world for a perception of, of safety or acceptance or whatever. Anything that occurs in that category, I think is something that we probably haven't accepted yet. And so from there, I see one of two options. Either you wrap your head around it and decide it's just something that you are, that you're only going to be frustrating yourself trying to go against it, or you identify it as something that you don't really want to be or something that you don't like, and you set about to change it in whatever way you know how. So that you can always be forthcoming about what you are or what you feel without it being linked to a fear of rejection. If that thing becomes solid enough, you know, if there's enough confidence imbued in that particular attribute, then it actually feels better, in my experience at least, to be honest about it and face pushback for that than it does to gain acceptance from a falsehood. Generally speaking, I think I'm pretty much an open book, especially when it comes to meeting people face to face. There are definitely things I don't like to talk about or feel uncomfortable sharing with anyone, but I think if I reflect on them, they are all things that I either don't like about my behavior or things that I haven't quite come to terms with yet or don't fully understand about myself yet. At the same time, there are things I feel comfortable saying, things I know will be controversial perhaps or might get a negative reaction that I actually feel good to say because I, I'm more connected with it. I've come to terms with it. That ends up being a great experience actually where I feel aligned with myself as long as I'm regulating myself and I'm sure I have the right emotions behind it and make the focus on its expression. That's key and like nothing else at all. Those moments make me feel stronger. And interestingly, I think they're also correlated with a higher chance of success in the eyes of others. It's a sign of strength that you know yourself and believe in yourself enough to say things even when they might not seem like what the other person's expecting. And I think that strength and confidence are things that generally people admire. One of the weird dangers about this whole game is that you are, you know, tiptoeing around everything and you're trying to please the other person. It has a very high possibility that it will do the opposite, that you'll leave no impression at all. Relationships like this or people like this will sometimes be triggers for that, you know, like wondering who you really are. But I think that ultimately it's an individual journey and it doesn't have to start with you know, these moments. In fact, I think the earlier it starts, the better it'll work out when these kinds of situations emerge. There he is. Looking amazing. Just don't leave anything unsaid. I did it for you as a grand romantic gesture. And I heard you like Sailor Moon, so I'm cosplaying as Tuxedo Mask. Yeah, I mean, his back's against the wall. He's super focused. This is the side of him I like the best, you know, the side of him that knows what he wants and then takes action and goes for it. He takes off his cape dramatically. <laughs> and gives it to her. <laughs> Get yourself a man who gives you his cape. It's me. It's me. You can have me. You can have all of me. You're welcome. Say it out loud. Tell him.
What an outlook on life. Yeah, it's been a process of huge awakening for her, just being around people. It's like grounded her to the earth, grounded her to a full range of people and emotions. But the fact that she can even see this or has this thought means that she's not a cold, hateful woman with only ugliness in her heart. You know, the fact that she can recognize this beauty in Miyuki means that it exists as potential beauty in her. It's just yet to be expressed or realized in the same way. Yeah, it's not easy. I mean, this awakening comes at the cost of great pain. You know, it's like her whole world being shattered. We're all a little worked up right now. It's okay. <laughs> Oh, I thought she said that out loud. I was about to say. <laughs> so the outfit did come up. If only Miyuki was as good at reading between the lines as he was at making balloon animals. Was it an app? You got an app for this? It's a giant, giant balloon. Did he blow up the school again? Hearts! <laughs> thousands and thousands of balloon hearts. I mean, he really gave her a beautiful visual display. A confession. Wow! Wow, this is so unbelievable. And the moon! Yeah. He's been busy. He just wanted to cosplay. He just wanted to dress up his tuxedo mask. Kage's confession was secondary. He just looked great, though. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's great. The Miyuki starter kit. Cosplay. Balloons. A fan. Poverty. <laughs> Octopus wieners. So many things come full circle in the show. Little things end up being super relevant. Yeah, it played her worst skill. Investigation. Very clever. I'll use this inorganic paper. What was Ishigami saying about the weather? Is the weather really that important? Yeah, and all. I was building to this. We got her alone. Wow. And take a balloon and make it. That's a huge gesture. It sure grew though. Yeah, I mean, really showing his feelings with action. It's so bizarre. I feel like this misses something so crucial. And this whole gesture is so, so beautiful. It's so great. It's just an amazing realization of who he is and his best qualities and knowing what he wants and going for it and valuing her and understanding her. There's like one part of it that, that bugs me. And I think that's that's still a, a part of essential growth for Miyuki that has to happen at some point. Speaking of individual journeys, I think the key for Miyuki, or for both of them actually, is the realization that they're not going to get what they want or think they need through the conferral of status via a confession. They can't actually. And this actually I think is really common. You know, I thought about it the exact same way. To my own great detriment a lot of the time, it's one thing to value someone, to think they're amazing and special and to recognize their gift that you feel maybe that you do not have. It's a whole other thing to play this this value game. Thinking that people are higher than you in some level. The trap there is in the thinking that if you end up with that person or get that person's approval or validation, that will confer on you those very things into your, your personality or being when actually it has very little meaning. What would have meaning is recognizing that that is something of value in the first place and then meeting an adequate level of, of that based on your own standards so that you you feel solid in whatever that thing is, more independently and on your own terms, rather than having it be kind of this, this gatekeeper thing where you need to be with someone to have their approval or to prove that you have it at all in an attempt to purge this weird sense of, of guilt or unworthiness. And that doesn't mean they can't be pursued simultaneously. I mean, you can obviously pursue great things before you're complete. I think it's a mistake to wait until you're perfect to do stuff, but he could confess right now and then just have faith that he could fill the gaps he needs to fill in order to become the man he thinks she deserves. But that is something that he has to do. And I think that that's what Kagi is waiting for. And it makes more intuitive sense to me personally for him to be the one who does that. It's interesting to me because they both seem to have the same thing going on where they look at the other and see something they themselves want to possess. But in a way, just my gut instinct is that what Kagi wants from Miyuki is a little bit more natural and healthy than what Miyuki wants from Kaguya. There's something kind of weird to me about this, the stat element 
development he's seeking. Because Kage's emotional development and her ability to be kind and conscientious and care about others seems more natural and is more important than Miyuki's desire to kind of be elite and escape from what he perceives to be a lower ranking in society. Just to me, it feels less important, first of all, less transferable, and also a little bit less about who Kaguya is and more about the things that she carries as a label, almost the things she might want to escape herself. I don't think it's been addressed as much as Kaguya's emotional development, but it's there for Miyuki as well. And, you know, him seeing himself as maybe lowly because he doesn't have this rich and powerful family like everyone around him does. Which is understandable given his environment, but I feel like to everyone watching, we immediately recognize that Miyuki's greatness exists with or without that. And you kind of just want to shake him and, you know, wake him up in the hopes of making him see how, how just amazing he is. <laughs> I mean, I know I'm overreading it somewhat. Part of this is just beautiful that he worships her on that level, I know, and adores her. My blue heart in remembrance of the blue ass that I left behind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who could it be? In 30 seconds, better detective work than Chika has displayed in three seasons. <laughs> That's like the one French word that I know. Ooh, did he ask for Kage as well? Can we apply for her? Can we apply on her behalf? Yeah, yeah. This is great. This is like really thinking it all the way through, trying to make it happen. Yeah, but he's earned it. I mean, he's got the social capital. Oh no, oh no. Well, Miyuki, don't overreact. This is just how she talks. Kawaii so. <laughs> Can you imagine if she actually did that? She's not actually going to do that, is she? <laughs> there you go, there you go. Not being deterred. Going to Stanford, probably. I mean, without the logistics, it's over. Yeah! That would be amazing. <laughs> to be with you forever. You should say that part, too. Yeah, that's a that's an appropriate first reaction. Right, father. Yeah, these are all valid concerns. I mean, this is it. This is the confession, right? We don't need anything more. We, we've done it. Wow. Hell yeah. Feels good though. Ooh, this is... I just love this energy. The can-do energy. It's gonna be difficult, but those are just challenges to be overcome. She could've just melted down. I told you, it's me. Ooh. <laughs> he squeezes the balloon for dear life. And you know there's one opportunistic guy in the crowd saying, telling his girlfriend that he, he did this blue display for her. I already have him. What I really want is your pain and envy. This whole love triangle is bizarre. What is her game? What does she want? Was this all a ploy to get Maki's attention? <laughs> this is the true power couple of Shuchin Hai though. Oh no, Miko's not here? Oh, that's admirable, but kind of sad. They seem like a great couple. <laughs> Made myself off of Miko. It's alright, she's a freshman in high school. She's doing fine. She'll figure it out. Oh, I showed up for her. Oh, I gave her the heart! Ooh, interesting. Ooh. And now he knows what it means. Not ruling them out. Not ruling them out as a couple later. This Tsubame thing might end up being practice. It's really thoughtful. It's a really sweet gesture. Well, she's being responsible. Be happy nice if she could enjoy it too. Partly your handiwork. Yeah, again, like, I just keep coming back to it. All of their eccentricities and character flaws, let's call them, work well and make you love them more because of moments like this. I mean, you can easily imagine someone like Miko doing what Miko does solely for the desire for, for power and that kind of person might feel disappointed that it was going well. You know, they might feel unhappy that it was going on and didn't involve them or they were receiving an outpouring of praise for what they'd done or whatever. But no, she's just a, a sweet girl who's happy that the thing is a success and that she did her job. It really has been a roller coaster. <laughs> you can stop now. This is like a good episode for everyone except for Chika. They did her dirty.
and then secret passageway because why not? Ooh! No, they wouldn't. They wouldn't. Would they? Is it? <laughs> it's just a room. What were they gonna see? Uh, uh. Oh, laser beam. Did they actually just kiss? I would like to see what Karen just saw before she died. Goodbye, Karen. Yeah, this made a mark, didn't it? That's a turning point. That's where this is going, isn't it? Yeah, we would also like to see. Show the audience. Oh, this is a- Oh, it's a flashback. It's a lot of nothing. <laughs> There's nothing really happened. <laughs> but it's still really sweet. Oh yeah, this moment. The ups and downs, the highs and lows. Oh! Man, I'm screwed by a balloon, but I'll take it. I really didn't expect that. <laughs> Whoa! This is unbelievable. I thought this was gonna be like a cliffhanger. There's just like nothing uncertain about this. They don't need to say anything. This is it. Yeah, well, our burning love definitely reached me. <laughs> Oof. Wow. That's unbelievable. I can't believe they did that. I, is it because they're not sure about the, the series continuing? I guess it works on two levels. You know, it leaves things open. There's still a lot of territory to explore, but in case the show is over, you know, it could end here. It could end here and I would be, well, I would be happy about it, but it makes everything worth it. It makes the journey worth it. Seeing the the montage of their mishaps was was really beautiful to me. Not even so much because of what happened, not because they ended up together. It's because I can feel so potently the feeling of that like before stage compared to the, the after stage. You know, when you, you fall in love with someone like that and you, you make someone the focal point of your whole world, the day to day and the wondering, will you, won't you, it's it's painful and stressful. I don't think you even realize how taxing it is until later in hindsight, you look back and you're like, wow, I was really worked up for a very long time. Like I spent a lot of energy on that. And all your work, all your anxiety, all your fear, all your effort, all your hopes and dreams, there's no guarantee at all that it'll amount to anything. You know, you could just end with you being crushed. But if you're lucky enough for it to come to fruition, it immediately changes the perspective of, of that whole thing, the entire journey into something essential and beautiful and narratively significant to your life. That's true not only of romantic relationships, it's true of, of great endeavors. You know, you struggle and you embarrass yourself and you fail and you wonder what the hell you're doing. Is this worth it? Who am I? Am I just a failure? And then the second you cross a certain key line in your mind where you're, you're happy about the result or you feel good about what you've done, everything becomes beautiful. Everything becomes so emotionally significant and powerful. And then the thing that you have now is made all the more beautiful by that struggle. That's sort of the, the game, you know, it's the risk reward of even wanting anything. You might not get it. I know that's where the pain comes from, but you know, if you do, man, is it going to be sweet? And this was really sweet. This felt like such a victory for, for both of them. And there are ebbs and flows to it too. You know, in fact, it's so powerful that it can go to a, a, a stage after that where if things start to go wrong or if it doesn't work out the way you wanted it to. It's made all the more devastating because of that history. You know, speaking of making things part of yourself, it's a really powerful force one way or the other. It can feel simultaneously like you're defying the universe, you know, against all odds this happened. And the universe gave me this, you know, that it was destined, that the universe wanted it to happen. And maybe there's something to that. Maybe that depth of, of power in, in emotions is a sign. You know, it's a mechanism for recognizing that we found something really important and significant for who we are. Because certainly Miyuki and Kaguya are very significant for each other and essential, even if they haven't identified exactly what that is yet and how much of an individual thing it will be. They're at least the catalysts for each other for that. So just a, such a great look back, especially just, you know, reimagining season one and what they were then to what they are now. It's so different. <laughs> yeah, there is. <laughs> I think she got the message. We don't need that anymore. We, we've, we've done it. We're there. We got it. This is him sort of having that <laughs> post big moment meltdown as always. I mean, try to, try to enjoy it. Bask in the, the glory of your accomplishments. Or at least she's enjoying it. The Shuchin after party. Oh no, is she gonna be one of those people that just gloats? Oh no. <laughs> he remembered all those complex elements of his plan, but didn't remember to brush his teeth. <laughs> Has one kiss and thinks she's the love master. Let's hear this advice. I'm sure we will all benefit. Wait, why? What was the blunder? Wait, what? What did she do wrong? What did I miss? I'm having trouble understanding this hand diagram. The fact that I don't know what's wrong is really concerning. What? I don't know. Oh no. Oh no. Please let me know in the comments what what is wrong with what you just said. I have no idea. At this point, it just feels like a victory lap. 
maybe momentum and habit. It just seems to be how she approaches her day-to-day -day life at this point. That's fine. I feel like the show also validated what I was saying to some extent early on. Like, it was never really going to be about the confession anyway. The confession's sort of useless without the more fundamental stuff. Kaguya-sama love is war ultra romantic. Man, super sad to see it end. Really enjoyed this ending. I mean, it's visually beautiful and very creative. But the more I think about it, the more I love the idea of rescuing Kaguya. Especially in light of some of the things she says, like in this episode, where, you know, she just is just devoid of emotion and life and hopes and dreams. A little normalcy. So nostalgic. I guess it would be appropriate for this to end in, in the room, in the student council room, which is a character of its own. So we're going at it. Happy life game two. Look at them, they look so natural. That's a relief to see. Oh, are they holding hands? They are! Wow. I'm so happy for them. <laughs> it's been such a long road full of so many misunderstandings and lost cues and heartbreak. It feels like such a massive payoff for, for everything. I'm so glad, you know? Of course, the best case scenario would be if the show continues into its you know full manga thing and there's there's a lot of potential i think the miguk miguk the american chapter would be super interesting i do really want to see what kaguya sama love is war has has to say about america commentary wise there's just so much to mine there it's going to be full of gold but the show could end here and i would be really happy with it and of course there's still a lot of things they need to develop their relationship in the sense is, is the beginning of the next chapter it's not a solution to all their problems in fact i think that is part of the next chapter is that discovery a shifting more to the individual and what they need to be even if the motivation for that is you know being strong enough or being a good enough person or a good enough partner for the other i mean there's so many things to say about this episode one of the things i i love is the way miyuki came through for kaguya the way he he took his feelings and and put it into action and i like how kaguya reacted to his plan you know i think sometimes there's an unseen opportunity in pain and that can be something like you know acknowledging that it's going to be difficult but using it as navigation to chart a path breaking it down into obstacles that at first glance might seem impossible you know i think that's the reaction most people would have had in kaguya's shoes but upon cl closer inspection is just a series of of doable things even if they're difficult and take a lot of time. It all ends up being energy and so the question is what do you put that energy towards? Miyuki giving I think one of the best possible examples of, of what you can do with that. You know, he's got all this fear and desire and angst, despair at how futile things seem, tension that he's been carrying for three seasons and longer but he just decided to act and he did it in a way that was magnificent and well suiting of his feelings for Kaguya. He didn't get bogged down by thoughts of I can't do that or it's impossible or it won't work out the way I want to. He just he just got to work and Kaguya to her credit did the same you know she's facing a lot of problems too her father is a big one if he doesn't approve does she have money to pay for stanford can she get a full scholarship how is she going to break the news to him does she even want to go to america in the first place i think that's probably the first question to ask but from yuki you know it wasn't just talk it wasn't just saying i want to be with you he took it to a level of reality and there's no way that kaguya looks at him and, and looks at that and doesn't love him for it and respect him immensely for what he's done i was trying to say something like this in episode 11 but i it was sort of an incomplete thought i don't think i articulated it very well i said something about we don't often do a, a good enough job about putting ourselves in other people's shoes in interactions we don't fully match the value proposition for others that we we are looking for for ourselves and what i mean by that is we we know well the depths of our own emotions and how strongly we feel about certain things but we kind of take it for granted that the other person can understand that and feel that the way we do you know we think that just by telling someone or expressing it in a certain way other people will get a level of utility for that that matches the level of utility we can feel in that situation that we, you know somehow we're conferring the extent of how deep it is just by virtue of having it whereas in reality those feelings are kind of limited to our perspective and exist in a, a more self-centered state. This happens all the time and I'm guilty of this as well where the thinking is something like well I'll bring this person on a date and then you know during the date I'll confess my feelings and I will <laughs> exist and so somewhere along the line my feelings will be adequately conveyed the person will see how much I care about them and that will create the kind of deep connection that I want and that's not impossible to convey but I think generally we, we overestimate how obvious our feelings are and how easily people can feel what we're already feeling. We sort of take our, our feelings as kind of a, a default as what exists already and expect the other person to tap into that, when most of the time it needs to be created through a combination of things. And so then the question is, well, what would do that? And that leads itself to a question of what is the other person? Who is the other person? And also, what are the tools you have at your disposal? And I think a lot of the time what you end up finding is that those are all things that you, you might have been able to prepare way in advance of any kind of romantic interest or more independently of, of a romantic interest. You know, what are the things people value? Well, they're probably things that are really difficult. They're things you have to offer that are rare and scarce and special. And that's something that you can develop at any time. I mean, look at Miyuki, for example. This whole plan is something he offered Kaguya that she just can't get. You know, people don't get this in the world. And why? 
why is he able to do that? Well, it's his hard work. You know, it's his grades, the fact that he can get into Stanford, the fact that he has special sway with the president and he can get a, a recommendation last minute. Why does he have that? Because he put in the work to make himself great. He's got access to the tower. He's got friends who will help him with the balloon plot. He's got balloon skills, which was no <laughs> small task for him. Those are all things that he did for Kaguya, but they were all things he kind of did alone. And I think there's a there's a lesson in that, you know, rather than waiting for the last minute and just hoping that, you know, your desire itself is of value to someone else, you can try to focus on being someone who just has a lot to offer. And that is a win-win no matter what, because even if people reject you, you still have all the same things that you've built. You know, that's that's greatness in you. And a nice byproduct of that is it makes your chances of getting what you want more likely if you have more, more tools at your disposal. One of the things that's really come clear for me watching this show is about uh, like a vision of self, you know, a vision of self specifically as it applies to romance. You know, what kind of person do you want to be? What is the kind of person that would be attractive? And not hinging it so much on other people's opinions, but rather your own opinion of yourself as reflected through others' opinions. You know, if you're thinking about self-worth, it's less important what, what other people think your worth is. It's more important that you catch whatever that thought is and use that as kind of a, a guiding star as to what you actually want for yourself. And then you trust in some sense that you'll you'll get what you need. You know, what you need will follow. In a sense, being process-oriented rather than results-oriented. Coming back to Kaguya again and her quickness to accept it, I really like the openness with which she she faced that you know i think a lot of times you'll talk to people and they'll they'll name something they want then inevitably will arise the conversation of possible steps to get there and in my experience and you know me doing this as well at times the gut reaction is to make it impossible because you instinctively realize how difficult it would be to do those things and also because you're looking at it all at once rather than breaking it down into discrete steps and processes. This comes up a lot for me when I talk about traveling. You know, people say they want to travel and for example, I'll say something like, well, you can teach English abroad and people say they don't want to teach abroad. And I'll say, well, that's fine. There are other ways, you know, you can try to build another source of income, maybe one that's online and it might take a couple years, but if that's something that you want and you think is good for you, then it might be worth pursuing. But that a lot of times is where the conversation will end because of how how big it is, it's too big. And it's not my call to you know tell people what they should and shouldn't be doing. What I do kind of object to is the automatic shutting down of things. For me, there's no nothing to lose by laying out the steps, trying to be as clear about it as possible, and then deciding if it's worth it, rather than seeing it as impossible. That kind of shuts a lot of doors prematurely. I kind of expect Akagi to do that, you know, given her history, but I think the the key for her is that she just wants it bad enough. You know, it's her whole world. So she was able to get there really fast. I think with that kind of energy, there's very little that's impossible. I believe that she will find a way to go to Stanford. And if she can't get into Stanford, she'll find a way to be with Miyuki if it means enough to her. So the whole episode was just such a powerful positive thing seeing them overcome their weaknesses seeing them face difficulty head on facing their own fears head on being rewarded for that that is the the payoff that i that i wanted and you know it's not over for them this show honestly could go on to america and marriage and kids and beyond because there's just so much you can mine out of relationships especially with characters this rich so i really want to see more but you know i think that my predominant feeling right now is gratitude it's gratitude for the show for taking me on such a wild and, and fun ride. You know, it did so many things so well simultaneously. It's really, really an experience. So yeah, that's the end of Kaguya for now. And we just hope that we get a season four, five, six through 12. I don't even know if the manga is finished to be honest, but I want to thank everyone for following this journey. Sometimes these these series are a little more quiet than, you know, the, the mainstream shonen, but I'm really, really happy to have them. I think it's such a necessary part of my experience doing this, not for everything to be a battle shonen. Not that I don't love those. I know those are great too. These shows kind of tap into something that is a little bit more lived for me. You know, the, the huge shows will be kind of the the really big, you know, the, the grand, the, the glorious, the heroic. And these shows also have an element of that. You know, there's nothing unheroic about this gesture that Miyuki did. You know, there's a big overlap there. But also looking at sort of the, you know, the subtler beats of life and the situational stuff that feels really good for me to, to articulate and talk about and to think about. So thank you to everybody who followed the, the Kaguya journey and for everyone who, um, recommended it. It's been a blast. Obviously couldn't do this or anything without patrons. So thank you to all patrons for all the support. Thank you to everybody who has followed the series on YouTube. As always, love you guys. And I will see you very soon for uh, Violet Evergarden is the next show in this slot. <laughs>